Uh, really pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Christina Chambers. When you think of pregnancy and medicine, I, I think you think of two names. Think of Francis Oldham Kelsey, who was the FDA officer who started at the FDA and was given the assignment of approving thalidomide, and she kept it from being approved in the U.S. Um, Unfortunately, after that, the FDA became much, much more powerful, and pregnancy was considered a horrible adverse event. And so nobody thought about pregnancy in medicine for years and years. And the second name is Dr. Christina Chambers, who in rheumatology particularly has been leading the effort to literally get data to say, how can we use the medications that we have appropriately in patients who are considering pregnancy, which is, of course, incredibly important. So uh, very pleased to have her here. Tino? Thank you so much. I've never been spoken about in the same sentence with Francis Kelsey. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much an honor. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation, Artie and Jack, to uh, come to this meeting. I'm the only non-rheumatologist, I think, in the room. Um, I'm an epidemiologist, and as Artie said, I uh, study um, pregnancy uh, with a variety of different underlying chronic conditions um, and the medications used to treat those conditions. But this talk today is really going to be about the underlying disease, which I think is so important to understand in pregnancy because so often we think that we can study a medication in the absence of really understanding what the contribution is of the underlying disease uh, to adverse pregnancy outcomes or what happens with the disease when a woman becomes pregnant. So these are my disclosures. Uh, the pharmaceutical company funding is for the many pregnancy registries that we run through Mother to Baby and through the NIH and a group called BARDA. So I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit that's known about the frequency of psoriatic arthritis in pregnancy and in women of reproductive age, a little bit about the clinical course in pregnancy, a summary of the literature, scant as it is, on risk of specific adverse pregnancy outcomes, and then uh, a word about the approach to planning for pregnancy and don't forget lactation, and then give you a couple of resources that we can offer. So in terms of the prevalence of psoriatic arthritis in women of reproductive age, a couple of references we can look at in, just in the general population uh, suggest that 0.19% uh, of, of adults in Europe may have uh, psoriatic arthritis with a range of 0.16 to 0.32%. Uh, and then another study in the Middle East suggested a lower prevalence, 0.01%, uh, with an upper bound of the confidence interval of 0.17%, thought to equally affect women and men, uh, onset often between 30 and 50 years of age, which uh, overlaps reproductive years, at least at the upper end of the range uh, for women. Uh, so certainly a possibility that women with psoriatic arthritis will become pregnant. So there's one study, um, and this is pretty uh, tiny to read, uh, that came out of a national inpatient database in the U.S. Uh, covering a few years up to 2014, looking at per 100,000 pregnancies, so this is in pregnancy, uh, the number of, of patients with psoriatic arthritis or a diagnosis of that. And you can see uh, in 2014, it's nine per 100,000, so about a tenth of what we saw in the general population. So it's not a very common uh, disease in pregnancy. Interestingly, the uh, this this rate in pregnancy seemed to uh, 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 track up you know, starting in 2011, and I don't know what that is due to. Um, the clinical course of psoriatic arthritis in pregnancy, um, there are limited data, uh, but the paper that I uh, distributed for the pre-read uh, was a, a nice, I think, systematic review uh, uh, by Meisner et al., uh, published in 2021, uh, and they looked at a, a big um, survey of the literature and came up with 13 eligible publications uh, that included 2,332 pregnancies, so that's... Uh, 
I mean, it's amazing that there's so few, but that's what was uh, encompassed in this uh, systematic review with psoriatic arthritis. And of those nine studies, uh, including 536 pregnancies, uh, actually had uh, included in the, in the study something on disease activity, which I think is critical, and you'll see that's a theme throughout this talk. Uh, about two-thirds um, across those nine studies were thought to have mild disease um, and one-third moderate to severe disease. Um, the data overall uh, from this systematic review indicated lo little evidence of a, a huge change in disease activity during pregnancy compared to prior to pregnancy, uh, but the data more strongly suggested that disease activity may increase uh, postpartum. And the caveat was that across these nine studies, disease activity was not uniformly measured um, it, uh, in, in these reports. So uh, a figure in that uh, paper uh, is shown here, um, and these were three studies uh, that specifically looked at separating out um, uh, arthritic uh, disease activity and psoriasis disease activity. Um, the dark bar showing um, an increase in disease activity in pregnancy prior, uh, compared to prior to pregnancy, and the uh, gray hashed bar showing an increase in disease activity in the postpartum period compared to pregnancy. So you can see the, the take home message here is that there seems to be evidence that this increase in disease activity is much more prominent, um, even though these sample sizes are small uh, in the postpartum period. So something to be aware of. Um, in terms of risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes uh, in pregnancies complicated by psoriatic arthritis, um, in that same systematic review, uh, nine studies assessed adverse pregnancy outcomes, and their take home or their conclusion um, by Meisner et al. Uh, was that they did not think there was strong evidence for an increased risk for gestational diabetes uh, in pregnancy uh, in women with, uh, with psoriatic arthritis or small for gestational age infants, so that's defined as less than the 10th percentile uh, for gestational age at the time of delivery and sex of the infant, so on the smaller end of the range. And then they didn't think there was uh, strong evidence for an increased risk for low birth weight, defined as about 5 pounds, 5 ounces, or 2,500 grams, irrespective of gestational age. Uh, they did think uh, that there was evidence uh, for increased risks, um, at least uh, some evidence that didn't rule out uh, increased risks for uh, preeclampsia, uh, so a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, uh, for uh, delivery by cesarean section, particularly elective uh, delivery, and they felt that there was some evidence uh, for an increased risk of preterm delivery, but the data kind of went in two different directions. So the figure uh, that was included in this paper, and I'm going to look at this because I can't possibly read that tiny print up there, um, uh, is not re uh, a meta-analysis. Uh, so you're not seeing a summary odds ratio or uh, risk ratio for each one of these outcomes. Uh, but what you are seeing is for the three to five studies that they were able to include in this, uh, how, they, how they fell out in terms of the point estimate for the odds ratio or the relative risk and the 95% confidence interval. So looking at preeclampsia, you can see that there are two studies uh, that showed a modest increased risk, 1.2 four or uh, thereabouts and 2.3 or thereabouts uh, for preeclampsia, and two that suggested no increased risk or no significant increased risk. Um, but uh, again, I stress that it's a modest increased risk. The baseline rate of preeclampsia in the general population is about 3 or 4 percent. Uh, gestational diabetes, no statistically significant increased risk for any of the three studies that were included. Um, for C-section, if you move over to the far right, elective C-section, you can see two studies show a modest increased risk of about uh, 50 percent, uh, and one that showed no increased risk. Uh, so that's where they pulled their conclusion that C-section, especially elective C-section, uh, there was evidence for increased risk. For preterm birth, it's a little bit, I, I mean, I look at that and think that it, there's evidence that there's an increased risk of preterm birth, although we have a couple of studies uh, among the five where the increased risk is not uh, statistically significant. Uh, but again, modest increased risk. These are, you know, in the 
the 20 to 70 percent increased risk range and not, you know, three, fourfold. Uh, for small for gestational age, really three out of the four studies didn't show any evidence of an increased risk, and for low birth weight, uh, neither study was statistically significant. So, um, Moving on to uh, uh, individual studies, uh, this is a paper coming from the Swedish National Register, uh, 2007 to 2017, and you're probably familiar with this. This is a population-based register where 99% of the population is included in it. it granted, it's Sweden, so the size of the, uh, the number of births in Sweden are the same as in San Diego, California, so it's a small population, but it's a, it's a complete population. Uh, so they identified 921 pregnancies with psoriatic arthritis, and they matched them uh, uh, 1 to 10 uh, to those without uh, psoriatic arthritis matched on maternal age, year of delivery, and parity. So they had 9,210 9, in the comparison group. And they found, this is uh, uh, Ramaeus et al. Uh, is the first author on this. They found that women with psoriatic arthritis compared to those without were more likely to be obese, uh, to smoke, and to have pregestational hypertension and pregestational type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So four risk factors for adverse pregnancy outcome that seemed to ride along uh, with having psoriatic arthritis. Uh, they concluded that there were increased risks for preterm delivery. Uh, the adjusted odds ratio they came up with was 1.69, with a lower bound of the confidence interval 1.27. So again, a modest increased risk, uh, but significant. And for cesarean section delivery overall, as we just heard in the systematic review, uh, with an adjusted odds ratio of 1.77 and a lower bound of 1.43. Again, a modest increased risk. Uh, they did, uh, I, I think, what was useful uh, in this paper, and uh, it really worth reading, uh, they stratified on treatment. Uh, so they had 495 who had uh, no indication of treatment with uh, conventional therapies or glucocorticoids one year prior to and during pregnancy, um, and 496 who had treatment either in the year prior to pregnancy or during pregnancy or both. And um, in this analysis, there are several tables uh, that cover the outcomes that they looked at, and I'm going to focus on preterm birth. Uh, so in this table, they compared non uh, psoriatic arthritis pregnancies to psoriatic arthritis pregnancies without treatment in the year before or uh, during pregnancy. And you can see uh, that it's only medically indicated preterm birth, uh, so there would have to be a reason like uh, poor fetal growth or uh, severe preeclampsia that would uh, 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 have an indicated uh, preterm delivery uh, where they saw a statistically significant increased risk for preterm birth. Otherwise, uh, the uh, the point estimates, although above one for overall preterm birth, were not statistically significant. Uh, then when they compared pregnancies with treatment, uh, they did find statistically significant increased risks uh, for preterm birth compared to non-psoriatic arthritis pregnancies of about twofold, um, and this was uh, true uh, pretty much across the board. Um, and the, the conclusion they drew, and I, I think uh, is reasonable, is that those who are receiving treatment as compared to those who received no treatment in those two years, the pregnancy year and the year before, likely had more severe underlying disease. Um, and in these, uh, another table from this uh, uh, paper, uh, they compared non-psoriatic uh, arthritis pregnancies to those who had treatment only before pregnancy, so only in that, that year before pregnancy. So now we're getting down to smaller sample sizes. So there was 170 in that group. And you can see the adjusted odds ratios here are now uh, attenuated, and there is no statistical significance for any of the preterm birth outcomes for those who were treated only before before pregnancy, and then when they looked at the 256 who had treatment during pregnancy, irrespective of what the treatment was, here you can see that the adjusted odds ratios on the far right column uh, suggest the increased risk is there with those who either continued into pregnancy or had pregnancy exposure. Again, suggesting that those who continued uh, treatment into pregnancy may have had more severe disease, and thus that's why they continued. 
And then uh, the last table I'll show from this paper uh, is looking at uh, stratifying on the type of treatment. And so here we're looking at psoriatic arthritis pregnancies with non-biologic DMARD treatment, so they were receiving conventional therapy or glucocorticoids um, com uh, compared to the non-psoriatic arthritis pregnancies. Again, if even further attenuation, there's really no evidence here of, of any uh, note of an increased risk for preterm delivery. Uh, for those on the non-biologic DMARD treatment. But when we look at those on the biologic DMARD treatment on the far two right columns, uh, you can see that even though we're down to it, again, a smaller sample size, uh, slicing and dicing with 103 in that group, um, that the adjusted odds ratios are substantially higher. So we're talking in the three to five fold increased risk for preterm delivery in those who are being treated with biologic DMARDs. And again, the, the interpretation of this um, it certainly can be that those who are being treated or channeled into receiving biologic DMARDs in pregnancy uh, are those with the most severe um, underlying disease. So moving on to uh, risk for preterm delivery in um, other covariates in this sample, they didn't put this in a table, so I'm just going to describe this. Um, they stratified on parity, uh, meaning that they looked at uh, individuals with psoriatic arthritis or not, uh, who were this was their first pregnancy um, versus a, a, a second or, or, or um, other uh, uh, future pregnancy. And they found that the risk for preterm delivery was really not only most pronounced, but it was pretty much restricted to first pregnancies in this analysis. And there's actually another paper that's reported the same thing. Um, and they found that those uh, who discontinued biologic treatment in those first pregnancies prior to pregnancy uh, were ones who had the, the highest risk of preterm delivery. So again, sliced and diced down to smaller numbers, but it's really intriguing to think about this, that in a first pregnancy, you know, are women more inclined to be more conservative about not wanting to continue medication, even though they may have disease that is, is uh, more active, um, and that's the reason why there was an increased risk. Um, the, it's intriguing to speculate about first pregnancies as well. Um, so we've reported before that, you know, and, and others have as well, that uh, um, preterm delivery uh, certainly can be mediated by preeclampsia. Uh, so if the mom has uh, preeclampsia or pregnancy-induced hypertension, that in turn is a big risk factor for preterm delivery. And first pregnancies are at substantial increased risk for preeclampsia. So maybe that's uh, the pathway by which this, uh, this may you know, be explained. Um, it, it's important to note that there was no assessment of disease activity um, in this study. And then others who commented on this study said it was unclear what the indication was for the biologics being prescribed. So was it for psoriatic arthritis or what? Um, another paper that actually preceded this one, and there's probably some overlapping data, uh, was from uh, both Sweden and a Denmark uh, National Register uh, from 2006 to 2018. A smaller number, 489 psoriatic arthritis pregnancies, matched again 1 to 10 on maternal age, parity, and birth year. Um, and they found an increased risk of preeclampsia um, in that analysis, an adjusted odds ratio of 1.8. So a modest increased risk, but statistically significant. And they, they looked at uh, just generically described maternal monotherapy treatment before pregnancy was associated with a further increased risk for preeclampsia, 2.72 odds ratio, and maternal monotherapy treatment during pregnancy associated with an elevated risk, uh, but uh, the confidence interval overlapped one. Uh, and then last, uh, uh, GANG-B, the, uh, the healthcare uh, cost and utilization project that I showed earlier for the prevalence of psoriatic arthritis in pregnancy. This is a national inpatient sample, uh, 2004 to 2014. They had 419 pregnancies with psoriatic arthritis, which they compared to everyone else, so 9 million without. And they found, as, as we saw before, that women with psoriatic arthritis were more likely to be older, uh, obese, um, so risk factors for adverse pregnancy outcomes, but, but in, in this inpatient sample, more, we're more likely to be white, have higher income, and be privately insured. 
And in their analysis, uh, they really found very little evidence of uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes. The one thing they did note on the, the, the first row in this table is that there was a significant, although modest, 1.5-fold increased risk for pregnancy-induced hypertension. Um, each of the other um, adverse outcomes that they looked at um, were not statistically significant, although the point estimates are consistent with what we saw before, uh, 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 somewhat elevated above one. And, uh, and they did look at small for gestational age, uh, less than the 10th centile, and in this study they did find an increased risk of the baby being small for gestational age, about a 2-fold, 2.5-fold increased risk, uh, but didn't find uh, significantly increased uh, evidence of major congenital anomalies or uh, stillbirth. And then last, a paper uh, that uh, Artie Kavanaugh is a co-author on that we did out of our uh, study at uh, Otis Mother to Baby uh, that Chelsea Smith led, a uh, small sample size, but again, looking at uh, active disease in pregnancy as measured by the HAC, and then active disease as measured by RAPID3 for uh, a small sample of 117 with psoriatic arthritis. And what uh, Chelsea found here was that uh, the assessment, if they had active disease um, in the first half of pregnancy, which was the time of enrollment. Uh, there didn't seem to be an association with preterm delivery, but if they had active disease as measured in the third trimester in, of pregnancy at about 32 weeks, uh, they had between a three and four-fold increased risk of preterm delivery. So again, you know, uh, going down the pathway of saying preterm delivery and active disease seem to go hand in hand. So poll question. Uh, pregnant women with psoriatic arthritis, A, are at very high risk for developing gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, preeclampsia, preterm delivery, C-section, and having a low birth weight baby. B, are at increased risk of pregnancy complications if they take medications for psoriatic arthritis during pregnancy. Or C, may have increased risk for adverse pregnancy outcomes if they have high disease activity or poor control. You guys are brilliant. All right. I hope this is going to let me there. Let me go. Okay. And then last in the last thirty seconds here, I'll just uh, make a pitch, and hopefully you've heard this many times before. Uh, the the approach to planning for pregnancy and lactation in women with psoriatic arthritis is not to wait till your patient tells you she's pregnant uh, to have the discussion and have the shared decision making between you as the rheumatologist and the patient who is a woman of reproductive age or potential uh, about about the options should the patient desire pregnancy, or even if she's not even thinking about it, uh, what if she were to find out she were pregnant? What, what position would you want to be in? Um, and, and that includes a careful assessment of the management of disease activity, um, and incredibly important to consider medication management in light of compatibility with pregnancy and lactation. Um, and then, uh, as was mentioned earlier, this, this seems to be high likelihood of postpartum flare or having disease activity increase in the six months after delivery. Uh, consider how you will deal with that. Poll question. Women with psoriatic arthritis who are planning pregnancy should be advised, A, to avoid pregnancy due to increased risk for poor outcomes, B, to discuss current treatments and disease activity severity with their rheumatologist and their obstetric provider and the need for continued therapy in pregnancy. C, to stop all medications prior to trying to conceive. D, uh, uh, be advised that there may be modest increased risk for some complications of pregnancy. Or E, B and D, or F, C and D. And again, you guys are brilliant. All right, and I will just end here with a couple of resources. Uh, if you're not familiar with Mother to Baby, mothertobaby.org uh, is a counseling network across the U.S. and Canada. It provides free uh, information to healthcare providers and patients about uh, exposures in pregnancy and lactation through text, chat, email, or telephone. Uh, and, uh, and it's through mothertobaby.org that we do the pregnancy registries that we conduct. 
And then I also want to call your attention that we have about 200 fact sheets on a variety of different exposures. Many of them are medications that you use um, it, in your patients that are available on our website and also in the National Library of Medicine also host them for us. And then we just launched a month ago, I'm really excited about this, uh, a mobile app that's free. Uh, it's LockedRx. You can get it in the App Store. And it is the National Library of Medicine's um, uh, former Locked Med. Uh, um, resource uh, about uh, drugs and lactation, uh, but now available on the app, so easily used and updated uh, so that it matches whatever's in the National Library of Medicine. So that's a resource for you. And I will end there. Thank you.